stumbling through my life with all the choices I have made. Looking to the right and left, so hard to find my way. Coming to a crossroad where I call the glimpse of Him, the Savior reaching out to me. thank God for you today. Listen, pray for those that couldn't be here today. There are some that's traveling today. There are some that's sick today that are away from us, and uh, you pray much for them that God will get them back soon and safe down the road. And listen, we're going to do what we always do. Uh, we need prayer, amen? And so we want to invite you to come gather around our altar for a time of prayer where the choir is coming down, and Blake plays for us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask his help. Father, we sure love you today, and uh, God, it's already been a privilege to be in the house, and God, we've already been able to come to you in prayer, Lord, several times, Lord, uh, Lord, even this morning. And, Lord, we're thankful, God, that you never get tired of hearing our prayers. And, God, we're thankful we can come humbly and boldly before the throne of grace. Uh, God, that we can find help in a time of need. And, Lord, if there's ever been a time, God, in our life and in the history of the church and in the history of America, Father, we need help today. And I beg you, God, to look down upon us, rain down upon us. Father, you might use us today for your glory. Thy will might be done completely, Lord, 
in our lives, that we'd seek your face, seek your will, seek your wisdom, seek your way. And God, we might seek your word today, Father, in all that we do. I pray, God, for every sick person today, Father, you'd heal and lift up in their life. I pray, Lord, for those families that have lost loved ones, Father, you'd fill that void. Uh, Father, in their life, you comfort, Lord, and encourage them, uh, Lord, in a special way, uh, Lord, today. And I pray, dear God, for those that are traveling away from us today, Father, you bless them, keep them safe. Uh, Lord, to their families today, God, those just down and out, depressed today, sick, cannot seem to get out, can't seem to get going. Father, would you reach out in the homes and bless them and strengthen them and encourage them. And Lord, I pray, God, you restore unto them the joy of thy salvation. Lord, that thy will may be done in their life. I pray to you, God, you'd help us we try to preach today. Lord, you'd give us wisdom of words. Everything that we need to say today, God, we'd say it in a, a very humble way. But God, we'd say it in a very encouraging way today, in a very bold way. That we might get the message across, Lord, that we might be better Christians. Father, for you, if there's one here today that's lost and undone. Lord, they don't know you as Lord and Master and Savior of their life. They've never committed their life to you. I pray, God, that today might be that day. They might be saved before it's eternally too late. I pray for churches and pastors throughout the land today. God, you'd encourage pastors today. You'd help congregations today, God, and they would, you know, they'd be stirred up for the glory of God. Lord, you'd move in, uh, Lord, on them today and rain down upon them. Give those pastors encouragement, uh, Lord, this morning. Give those congregations encouragement and strength to back the man of God today and shout him on. Uh, Lord, we may see the glory of God. I think about what Brother Kidd said uh, on Monday night. Father, we ought to be able to praise our way into revival. And God, we ought to be able to praise our way into the glory of God. Lord, you've been so good to us. You've done so much uh, for us. We ought to be so thankful to God that we just shout day in and day out of how great a God we truly serve. And Lord, that we're able to be where we are this morning. Lord, we got up. Lord, on our own, dressed ourselves, got to the house of God. Father, you furnished the way, and Lord, the money to put the gas in. And Father, thank you for the Sunday school hour this morning and the teaching we've already had, God, and the stirring, uh, Lord, within our couples down there. Thank you for that so much. Now, God, use this time, Lord, right now this morning. Father, you might be worshipped, magnified, and glorified through all that's said and done. And Lord, we'll thank you, love, for what you've done, what you're about to do. We certainly praise you for it. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, amen. Well, amen. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, we sure do appreciate you being here uh, today. Thank God for the service we've already had in the Sunday school hour this morning. Had a real good time down there with our couples. And if you're in here and you're in that adult age, uh, we just finished probably our last super Sunday for this year uh, down there, but we are going to do a meal uh, for all of them on, the, on November the 23rd, Saturday afternoon at about 4 o'clock. We'll be announcing that, and if you're here and you didn't get to come to the, uh, to the Sunday school class and didn't get to be a uh, part of it, we would love to come be a part of the meal. We're going to finish up a little bit of devotion that day, have a meal, have a good time of fellowship, play some games, give away some prizes and those kind of things, so we want you to come and uh, be a part of it. We have enjoyed that to the fullest uh, down there, because I've said many, many times, so goes the home, so goes the church, amen, and we need to strengthen the home, strengthen the marriage, strengthen our spiritual life, and so I praise the Lord for what he's done through that, uh, and what he's going to do through that. Uh, also, several things uh, today, no junior class today, I understand, and so just remember that, uh, if you would, uh, and also men's Bible study, uh, we're going to start the men's Bible study next Saturday morning at 6.30 in the morning, okay? And uh, we'll start at 6.30. We'll do, do our little bit of a meal. We'll start teaching right at 7. We'll be done at 8, and you can go on your way. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some things there next Saturday to explain to you what we're going to do uh, for a few weeks here and there and just try to help us out. I know we got a lot of stuff coming up in November with Thanksgiving and Christmas and all those, and I'm not going to try to tie, tie up every Saturday for you. We may get a few things done and move into uh, next year with a, with a longer Bible study. Uh, but listen, I enjoyed our last time together so much. I sure don't want to uh, miss that with the, with the time spent with our men uh, down there. So come, and we'll have a good time of fellowship together uh, and a good prayer meeting and just thank God for what he has done. Uh, and let me just say this. Uh, I will soon be starting, and I'll give you, i, I, I got to get back into Sunday school class because I'm going to probably teach this during the Sunday school class with our men as soon as we finish the lesson that we're on right now. Uh, I'm going to put somebody else on the back burner for a little while, and uh, I'm going to teach a deacon class in our Sunday school class. 
And I think we're, what, about a week or so from finish up the lesson we're on right now. Is that, that about right, Brother Chris? Somewhere around a week or so. Uh, and so if we can finish that up in the next week or so, uh, then I'm going to be in the men's class teaching on Sunday morning, okay? And if you would like to come in there, you don't have to be a member of our church. I mean, you, you have to be a member to be a deacon here. But if you uh, want to come and learn and be a part of that, then I want you to come and learn uh, what it takes. And so we're going to be working with our men on that for a few weeks in our Sunday school class because we're about to install some deacons in the church, uh, hopefully soon down the road. And so that's going to be done on Sunday morning during the men's Sunday school class uh, time. And I'll teach, teach a little bit each Sunday until we get uh, through with it. I'm excited about seeing what God's going to do. Amen. Uh, through these things, we're learning and growing together. And let me just say this. Uh, as of right now, we have suspended our Sunday night services, uh, maybe for a while. I, I don't know how long it's going to be, uh, but we had a business meeting last Sunday afternoon. We discussed that. One of the main things we uh, discussed last Sunday, and the church has voted to suspend them for a while, uh, and we may pick them back up uh, down the road, and I am okay either way. I want you to know that. And so if we pick them back up, my prayer is that we'll miss it so much we'll run back to it. Amen. That's my prayer. Uh, but I understand. Let me just say this. Uh, it is the Sunday night crowd that has been here all that time for almost 20 years now that have been faithful to that. And they're tired. And I fully understand uh, being tired and wore out uh, over some things. And we get tired and wore out too. And so we want to take a little break for a while. Uh, but we are going to do some things here. Now you say, Preacher, I thought we were going to get a break. I, we're going to give you a break. Amen. Um, but with all that said, Amen. We are going to be scheduled some different things to do here and there on Sunday afternoon from time to time uh, to keep ourselves together, keep some fellowship. So with all that said, next Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, we're going to meet with anybody that wants to go. We're going to take the bus. We're going to take the van, ever how many we have. Uh, we're going to go out to a couple of the elderly in our community that's part of our church that cannot get here. We're going to take church to them. We're going to go. We're going to read some scripture to them. We're going to sing some songs to them. We'll be back Christmas carol to them before you know it. Amen. Uh, but we're going to go and do some things for them and take church to them uh, every every other Sunday or so. We don't, we'll schedule the times uh, to do it, but we're going to do it at 5 o'clock next Sunday afternoon until time goes back next week, right? And it'll start to get dark earlier, and I can't keep you all out after dark, amen? We'll turn into a pumpkin. We don't want to do that. And so, uh, But next Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, write that down. We gonna, we're not going to have service, but at 5 o'clock we're going to go out. Uh, to a couple of elders, we're going to sing some songs, and I'm going to read some scripture to them, and uh, just take church to them. They get to watch our services every week, uh, but it's nothing like, listen, there's nothing like fellowship and worship, amen? And so we want to be able to do some extra things since we're not going to have the Sunday night service uh, right now. And listen, we're just going to see how that goes, and whatever God does, uh, God does. But I know that I know that people are tired, and I fully understand that, we want to work with you uh, in that. It's new for me, I will tell you that. It is very new for me. Uh, and it's hard for me to, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, amen? Uh, but y'all are working very hard on it, amen? Uh, but uh, we're going to see how that works out, and uh, we will work on that. So don't forget that next Sunday, and we will, we'll have a good time in the Lord. Men, we'll talk about uh, mow, yard mowing this Wednesday to see if we need to uh, get that taken care of or not. If you have not voted, go vote. <laughs> amen? Uh, go and vote. That's all I'm going to say about that this morning. You know my, my spiel on that, but go and vote, and uh, we need a change in America. And so please do that if you would, okay? Anything else today? I may have forgotten. I'm going to do some birthdays in a second, but anything else? Be November the 23rd, Saturday afternoon, 4 o'clock. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep putting that word out. I invite somebody to come. If you've not been coming to the class, you're still welcome to come. We want you to be a part of it. Uh, and listen, I'll listen. I'll bring a can of string beans that day. I don't have a problem with that. Amen? <laughs> and I'll shop food line every now and then. Uh, but we want you to sign up what you can bring that day. Have a good feast together uh, and just have a great time. We're, we're excited about that and uh, trying to grow that. 
we praise the Lord for that. Amen. All right, let me do this today. Uh, before we do anything else, we got some birthdays and anniversaries in here today that I know we want to try to recognize. And so if we got a birthday in here or you've had an anniversary uh, this last week or so and you have not been sung to yet, we want you to come up this morning and uh, we're going to sing to you today. Amen. And most people know who you are. We will call you by name because we're in a Baptist church. Amen. And we'll rat on you around here. Amen. Birthdays, birthdays, birthdays. Anniversary over here. Amen. Uh, Will, Will had a birthday. Come on up here, Will. Miss Harris had a birthday. You go how old? Praise the Lord. Birthday, you got one anniversary right here. Brother Blaine, you saw him 27 years. Is that right? 27 years from Brother Howard and Brother Kevin Murray. Amen. And so uh, let's, let's all sing. Let's sing happy anniversary first and we'll sing happy birthday. If you would come on up this morning, we'll get our ushers to come up this morning, and uh, we appreciate the birth. Listen, as one preacher said, be thankful you're as old as you are. If you wouldn't, you'd be dead. Amen. And so I'm thankful I'm as old as I am today. And uh, as soon as we say the blessing over the offering, the prayer over the offering today, we're going to be standing and singing page 350 in the suite by and by. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the, ask the blessing over the offering, Brother Cruz, if you would, sir. How about lead us today? Let's stand page 350 today, sweet by and by.
Charlotte come on up today. I understand they're going to sing for us today. Miss Krista was getting here earlier, and she's still around here. Amen. And I didn't know where he was. I've got a, a, a gas card for him today <laughs> before he leaves here. I mean, I understand he needs one so he can make it home. I, yeah. <laughs> I just want to tell him that. I, want, I, I wanted him in here when I told him that, though. Amen. And I, I'll, catch, I'll catch him later with that. Amen. Most of you don't know what I'm talking about, but she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. All right. Listen and sing today. Counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shores. See that he sparrowed our fault. He made the mountains and the seas. He's in control of everything of all creatures and small. Cause he knows my name. Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry, and he knows my name. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause he knows my name. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I can't tell you what's in store. I don't know a lot of things. I don't know the answers to the questions of life. But I'm knowing who I have believed. And he knows my name. Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry, and he knows my name. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause he knows my name. He knew who I was when he carried my cross. He knew that I would fail him, but he took the loss. He knows my name, every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. And he knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. Can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine. He knows my name. Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. As he knows my name. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine. He knows my name, every step that I take, every move I make, every tear that I appreciate that today, and I appreciate you being in the house of God this morning. Turn your Bibles this morning, Mark chapter number 14, Mark chapter number 14, I'm going to read two verses here in just a minute, verse 70 and 71, uh, let me say thank you to all of those that went with us to the revival meeting this week, and Brother Kidd, uh, we had an awesome time uh, on Monday night and Tuesday night being there, and a great messages both nights, we laughed till we cried. 
and uh, then we just wept and praised the Lord a lot. Uh, I will tell you that. One thing he said on Monday night that we should be able to praise our way into revival. Amen. And uh, so we should be able to look at the glory of God and praise our way uh, into the joy of the Lord uh, in our life. That's something we have to do uh, in the midst of that. And so I appreciate those that went with us and had a great time with us uh, there. But Mark chapter number 14, verse number 70 and 71, uh, I'm going to preach to you on a thought that God gave me this week on these scriptures. I uh, just recently read through here, and I was looking at some things here uh, in the Word of God. And I'm going to try to use... Uh, what I'm going to call some reverse psychology on you uh, today, amen, because I know none of us need a, need any help in the matter that I'm going to preach on uh, today, so I'm, so I'm going to use some reverse psychology on you uh, to try to help us out. I know it helps me out, but look with me in verse number 70 today, and look what he said here. The Bible says, and he denied it again. Man, and I promise you I could stop right there, park right there, and we could preach for the rest of the day. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. Verse 17 is where I want to preach from today. But he began to curse and to swear saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. I didn't read this whole chapter because of the length of it and the time that it would take to read all of it, but I'm going to explain a lot of it, and I'm going to use a few scriptures out of this chapter today to try to help you in the thought I'm going to give you here in just a second. At this time, in this moment, in Peter's life, we find that Peter was in a backslidden condition. Now, I don't know when's the last time I ever, if I ever did, preach on backsliding uh, in the church. I have no doubt mentioned it uh, a time or two in messages. But uh, and I look at Peter's life here, and I read this whole chapter, and you would have to say about Peter at this time, he was surely in a backslidden condition in his life. But let me say this before we get too deep into the message in case I don't get there today, just so you understand uh, what God can do. I want to give you that uh, maybe the climax or the conclusion of uh, Peter here in this story and in his life, the same man here that was cursing and swearing and saying he knew not that man was the same man that was called uh, to preach on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls got saved. And I told you that to tell you this, that just because you're in a backslidden condition uh, does not mean you have to stay there. It does not mean that it's the end of you and you're done with and everything's over with and you don't, that you have to stay there. You do not have to stay in that condition or in that position in life. I realize that Peter was surely backslidden at this time, uh, but I find that God called him, and I'm sure that crowd around him thought that he would be the last one uh, to be called to preach at the day of Pentecost, but God called him, and 3,000 souls were saved. But before Pentecost... Peter wrote the guide on backsliding. He literally wrote the guide on backsliding. And so today, I want to preach to you on this thought, the guide to backslide. You might say, preacher, here's a reverse psychology. Why would you tell them how to backslide? Why would you tell them what comes from backsliding? Well, my prayer is that God will get a hold of our hearts and we might abandon it before the fall. That we might abandon it before it's too late in our life. We may abandon it before uh, God closes a door on some things in our life because there is such a thing as backsliding. But I want you to understand, we do not have to stay there in that condition in our life. And so today, as I try my best to preach to you on this thought, a guide to backslide. I want you to understand that backsliding is a process. 
Uh, matter of fact, I think there's several different types of backsliding in God's Word that we can find. If we look at the Word of God here, uh, I, I think about Eve uh, there in the Garden of Eden where backsliding originally started from. The, uh, we look at Eve's life. There's several things. Here's the, here's the uh, uh, process that took place in her life is that she first listened to the wrong voice, amen, uh, and then she saw, uh, and then she desired, uh, and then she partook, amen. And so there is a process to backsliding. The average Christian that I know and what I read in God's Word, it, it's not something we just, boom, we just do it all of a sudden in one day and, uh, and we're done with it. There is a process to getting in that condition in our life. As I went back this week and began to look at David's life, and I've uh, read the stories of David so many times, uh, it's unreal. I look at David's life and a man after God's own heart. But listen, David did the same thing that Eve did, amen. Uh, he saw, he desired, and he went after it, uh, and he took it, amen. And I said this about David uh, some years ago, that thing it ensnared his mind. Uh, and we got to be careful in our life because there's things that ensnare us uh, from time to time. Then I said this about David. Here's the one step that we find in the midst of all this that David showed us, and he erased all his reasoning, amen? Uh, when we're in a backslidden condition, most of the time, you're not going to reason with people. Uh, no matter what you tell them, no matter how good you have been to them, no matter how, what you have taught them, if they get in a backslidden condition, they have an answer for everything that you say, and there is literally no reasoning with them. Uh, I had to look at somebody recently and shake their hand and say, I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> I can see we're not going to be able to reason about this. And so let me just shake your hand and walk away. Tell you I love you as a brother and we'll go on about our business because you're beyond reasoning right now. And I walked away. Sometimes you have to. You don't have a choice. But that thing ensnares our mind and uh, it, it erases all of our reasoning. And if we're not careful, it will eclipse everything that God's ever done for us. When we get in a backslidden condition, it will eclipse everything that God has ever done for us because we can't see God at that time, amen. We're not close to God. Remember I said about Lot last week, it was God that visited Abraham, but God sent an angel to visit Lot, amen, with a warning, with a strong warning, amen. Why? Because Lot at that time had no fellowship with God. So he had to send an angel down there. And so we get in that condition. So I begin to look at Peter's life uh, this week, and I believe if I had to uh, say Peter's backsliding here was totally different than David's. Peter's backsliding here was totally different from Eve. And so I begin to look at his life, and there's some things I believe we look at in Peter's life that I can really believe that, that Peter wrote the guide to backslide. He wrote the guide to backslide. And so I'm going to tell you today how to backslide. <laughs> Not that any of us need any improvement on it. Y'all will get that in a minute. Not that any of us need any improvement on it. But I'm going to tell you how. Amen. And so you won't be able to stand before God and say, Lord, I didn't know that. Amen. You won't be able to look at your mom and dad down the road and say, well, I didn't know that. No, your preacher's already told you that. Uh, I'm going to give you the guide to backslide, and it's up to you to look at it and say, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, now I know that. I ain't going there. That's the reverse psychology. Or we can totally ignore it and fall. We can go ahead with it and destroy our life, but you, either way, you're going to know what it is in life, amen? There's sometimes with our children, uh, when they're beginning to do things in life, we're better off to go ahead and tell them about the birds and the bees. I will never forget this story when I was talking to my boys coming along and sitting in the truck with them, amen? They got about 14, 15 years old. And I looked at Michael, I said, Bud, you want me to explain the birds and bees to you? He said, no, Dad, I don't want you explaining nothing to me. I said, well, I'm going to explain them to you anyway. You need to know. You need to know the dangers, amen? Because there's dangers out there. They don't want to hear that 
uh, hear that junk, amen, and, and I know there's no doubt that, that Jane set our daughter down, amen, some years ago as a teenager and said, look here, young lady, here's what happens if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, here's what happens, and here's the consequences of it, amen. We never try to fail telling our children uh, those things. Some of it was reverse psychology on them. We were hoping they, we were hoping they would get the message, amen, and they'd know when to turn around uh, and not go that route. And I pray that this will help you today. And listen, it's helped me just studying it uh, and looking at it because uh, Peter didn't backslide like Eve, and Peter didn't backslide like uh, David did. It was a totally different route in his life. We look at David's life and say, listen, well, I, I didn't look at anything, and I didn't, win, I didn't go uh, take anything, but when we get done with Peter today, we're going to be on a road to God on it, amen? And so I want you to listen to Peter's life here and think about the things I'm going to tell you today uh, about Peter as we break down his life step by step. Number one, with Peter, look with me at that same chapter, Mark chapter number 14. Look with me back to verse number 29. We find that Peter's number one problem here in his life was self-confidence. Self-confidence. Look what the Bible says. But Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Peter's worst enemy was himself. Peter got too confident in himself. And listen, I want to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with some self-confidence. We need that. You've heard me say probably a hundred times from this pulpit, when we know who we are, we can be who we are, amen. There's some things we ought to be confident uh, in in our life. But we got to be careful to not go past that margin and, oh, God, not go pl past that uh, plane in our life where that we think that we're somebody, we got it all together, and we cannot be touched, and nothing's going to happen to us, nothing, nothing, nothing's going to uh, come our way. Listen, I've, I've spoken to preachers before, and they start running this one down and, and running that one down, and I tell them, listen, you better stop real quick, my friend, because you're just one word away from that. My buddy, one of my best friends, is always picking at me, texted me this week and said, hey, told his wife on him. That's all it takes, and he knows that. He likes to aggravate me and punch me with that every now and then. Hey, that's all he says. Matter of fact, I seen somebody the other day that mentioned him. I said, let me show you what that rascal texted me yesterday. Amen. Hey, listen, we ain't but one step away from it. I got it. That, that'll never happen to me. That'll never happen to my children. So listen, friend, that was Peter's number one problem, that Peter had too much self-confidence in Peter and not enough confidence in God himself or Christ himself. Peter got overconfident within himself. He said, listen, all of these may be offended, but not me. <laughs> you want to know the time that I've been told as a pastor, Pastor, you won't ever say anything to offend me. Let me just say this. That wasn't any of y'all. <laughs> and I'm just being honest. <laughs> that wasn't any of y'all that's in here today, amen. There's some empty pews in here uh, today, but it was not any of y'all that told me that, amen. And I'm thankful that you did. Don't get so confident to, to think that I can't, listen, I can't uh, run you off or I can't say something to you uh, to offend you because I, I promise you I'm pretty good at it. Uh, from time to time, but that's that's the confidence that Peter had. Uh, not me. I'll never get offended by it, uh, Lord. They listen. They may all get offended, but I'm not going to offend. Listen. That's when it happens to us the worst. We better get control of ourselves and realize that we're not in control. Amen. That our confidence better be in God and say this. Listen. I'm going to do the best that I can. Amen. I'm going to do all that I can. Listen. I'm going to try my very best. God, you know what you got to uh, work with. But have I had to apologize a few times? Oh yes, I have. Peter's number one problem here was self-confidence within Peter, and we got to be careful. We got to say, "Oh, we're saved. We're born again." I've been in church for 22 years. I've never missed a, a Sunday school. Uh, I got a, a load of Sunday school pins uh, this long. I've never missed a church service. I've never missed a, a Wednesday night. I've never missed a, a, a Sunday night service. I, I've been there for every choir break. All that's good, <laughs> but you better not rely on self. It is that stinking flesh that we live in every day of our life. As a matter of fact, I said this on Wednesday night. Well, we had the, the best time on Wednesday night, but the hardest time on Wednesday night. I thought I was a pretty good Christian until I got to teach in Matthew chapter number 5. I thought I could do pretty well on the Ten Commandments, and I found out I could do real good on the Ten Commandments. I just couldn't do real good on the Beatitudes. 
I couldn't be do good on those laws where the Lord himself strengthened, amen, and said he strengthened them. I couldn't do very well on that. And listen, we dealt with this another night uh, on Wednesday night. Well, in fact, the last two Wednesday nights I talked, uh, we dealt with dealing with the enemy and loving your enemy. Amen? Oh, I, listen, I can love my enemy. <laughs> yeah, right. You need to be here on Wednesday night. You probably don't know who your enemy is, amen. Uh, but we have tried to find out who the enemy is, and we described him. And guess what? I have a hard time loving him. I ain't so self-confident I think I can't fail. Well, we can make a mistake in a minute, but Peter got self-confident in his life. Listen, uh, not only that, he uh, step number two, he started boasting. Amen. I'm glad we're saved by grace. Uh, amen. Say by say by grace that not not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. And I, I listen, I've heard those boasts from time to time about this and about that. But here in verse number verse number thirty one, the Bible says this right here in the same chapter. But he spake the more vehemently, <clears throat> if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Like so also said they. Said they all, listen, every one of them said, Lord, listen, we, we, we're not, we, if we should die, we're going to, but the Bible says about Peter, he began to boast about it. He said it more vehemently in his life that he made it known to everybody. Listen, I understand, y'all offended, but I can tell you right now, all of y'all might leave, but you're looking at one right here that ain't going to leave. I ain't going nowhere, amen. I'm going to stay by the stuff. I'm going to stick by the Lord. They'll not be able to run me off. And if I have to die for the cause, I'm going to hang in there. Got to be careful with boasting in our life. And we get overconfident and we begin to boast. And uh, I don't have the time to go into those that over the years begin to boast and talk about what they were going to do. And they boasted, but listen, that one that starts boasting way too much, you better, you better be very careful. You better keep your eye on them. You better watch them and watch what's going on. Number three, step number three in Peter's life, I believe he got unwatchful in his life. The Bible says here in verse number 37, and he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter. I wonder why he said to the rest of them. The Bible says he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could not thou watch one hour? I believe one of the greatest dangers in our homes and in our churches now is lack of watching. I believe it's one of the greatest dangers in backsliding in our life. That we're not watching what's coming into in our life. We're not watching also what's going out of our life. I get criticized sometimes at the church here as a pastor for, for micromanaging. I've tried not to uh, do that over the years, but they're like, well, you micromanage every little thing. Everybody's got to come through you. Everybody's got to say, if you don't ask for it, listen, I, I get so sick of that. Yeah, but I kept that sorry devil out of your home. I kept him out of the church, amen. I kept him from tearing down the church. Amen. I, I kept that false prophet from being in the, uh, in the pulpit. We kept that away as much good. Is there any good there at all, amen? We've got to be watchful in what we do, amen. If we're not watchful, the backsliding starts uh, in our life. You listen, P Peter went to sleep here, and sleepy souls are easy marks for Satan's temptation. And we begin to fall asleep on God, and we don't watch what's coming in our life. We don't watch what's coming in our home. We don't watch what's coming in our church. This, this is a crazy little uh, illustration here. And we can be as strong as we want to be. As strong as we want to be, but things happen. And some of you, I've told you, you've heard this story before. Some of you have not. You're going to like it. My best friend, WB, that's dead and gone home to the Lord now. Uh, Brother Cliff will remember this well. He was with us. Some years ago, we were flying home from the Dominican Republic. How many... How many of y'all did not know W.B.? You never met Brother W.B. There's a lot of you that didn't, didn't know him. And he was the biggest, strongest guy around. I mean, he had arms like this, right? He had a chest out here like this. He had mockingbird legs, and I used to tell him that all the time. I said, why don't you do legs for a change? A big old ugly chest you got, and your legs won't hardly tote it around. I talk junk to him. <laughs> we were down in Puerto Rico one time, worked all day long. He was one of these men when he got, got shower time, come off the job. He would run past every old guy down there and run to the shower. He did that one day. He was in Aguadilla down there. been working all day long about 5 o'clock. Coming in off the roof, sweating, tired. There were some guys with us, 50 years old. Uh, more w, I'm going to get a shower. I'm like, hey, hey, let these old I'm going to get a shower. I looked at him. I said, you ain't got nothing but a big chest and hot air is all you are. <laughs> Them old guys looked at me like, are you serious? 
I said, he ain't nothing. He's a bunch of hot air. Look at his legs. I said, he can't hardly walk on them. I talk stone junk, stone junk to him all the time. You could tell we were best friends because don't he'll kill me. Amen. We were at the airport, Brother Cliff. You remember this well. He fell asleep. He made a mistake. All them people ran the airport. They looked, and he said, Cross him, a big old arm, you know, couldn't get his arms crossed. And it took him all the time we was lifting, you know. He just, Josh said he didn't have to move but four inches. And Josh was first cousin. He didn't have to move but four inches. The rest of them had to move 18 to 20 inches, you know. He's laying down that back in that seat sleep. I told the guys, I said, I told Brother Cliff, I believe it was, I said, get your camera. We knew we was going to do a video when we got back home. I said, Cliff, get your camera. And I went over there and made me a sign and put on that sign and said, I'm a sissy. And I snuck over there and I laid that thing on his chest while he's laid back like this right here. A big old sign says, I'm a sissy. And Brother Cliff took a picture. So Brother Cliff and his Amy was doing a video when we got back. Well, he slept long enough, I took that sign off. And I made another one that says, and I'm stupid too. <laughs> Y'all got to be careful with us. And I got that thing on his chest and he laid back. He ain't even seen it. Took that picture. I'm stupid too. Ain't nobody said a word. Not one. All the people around us are looking, thinking, if that Mr. Big Guy wakes up, y'all are dead. I know they were worried to death he's going to go crazy when he wakes up. And so ain't nobody said a word. We come back to the house about a week later. Brother Cliff and him made the video, and we all over there, and the other auditorium was real close over there anyway, just a crowd of people. And, and we were doing the video night. We put it, we made it the last two pictures on video. And W's all up in there, all prim and proper, your little bow tie on. He's sitting up here in his big old arm, this, that, and the other. We, man, we didn't show the old video, everything that went on while we were down there in Puerto Rico. The last two pictures comes up and says, I'm a sissy and I'm stupid too. <laughs> if you could have seen the look on his face, Brother Cliff, I remember that. Like, yeah, I wish I had a video of him. He's like, no, y'all didn't. No, y'all didn't. I know you didn't do that. I said, fall asleep on us again. The devil's always lurking around somewhere, amen. He's always trying to get in. He's always trying to make us look stupid. He's always trying to make us look silly. He's always trying to make us look like a sissy in our life. Amen. He's all, listen, he's always strategizing against us all the time. He's always watching. And the very moment that we get unwatchful in our life, he moves in. He moves in. And he can do some pretty rough things. People said, I wouldn't do that to my buddy. I will. I got some good friends I'm close to. Why would you do that, preacher? Because they would do it to me. <laughs> I'm not for that doing to others. You know, they do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding right there. Amen. Uh, listen, we had a great time with that. And I know it sounds like a silly story, but is that not the way the devil works? You tell you what we got to do, church. We got to watch what comes in our home. We got to watch what flows in these eyeballs right here. We got to watch what flows. And it's fine. You've heard me say before, whatever goes in here, that thing settles back there, and it's always back there. Amen. We ought to be careful with that junk uh, in our life. But he says here, Peter, Peter began to sleep, and he got sleepy, and he got lazy on God. And listen, Satan is not, he's never more tempted any worse than when you are now asleep. WB's the same one that told me he was down at the beach, and me and him, we were so close. And he'd come to me for, for guidance and help all the time. Loved him. He was a dear friend of mine. And uh, he said, come to me when we get him and his wife and kids going to the beach. And I remember when he came back uh, that time and came to him. He said, preacher, I got, I got to tell you something. I said, what is Buzz? He said, man, I was at the beach the other day. And listen, we all know what goes on at the beach. Amen. I mean, there's pretty girls and handsome guys. And, you know, and most of them, most of them half naked and everything else. And he said, he's standing out there on the beach. And he said, listen, I, I, I'm doing what I wasn't supposed to be doing. He said, oh, devil, skip Slipped, tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, uh, I thought that was you with your guard down. I thought that was you with your guard down. We have to be careful. Listen, these are guides to backslide. Guides to backslide. Step one, self-confidence. We've got to be careful when we get so confident we start boasting about our life and who we are and what we are uh, in life. I would like to think, listen, I would like to think that I could charge hell with a water pistol. Amen? But I'm going to tell you what, when hell shows up, it might be a different story. A lady sitting in that congregation over there one time years ago, I remember this specifically, and I was preaching my heart out one Sunday. I'll never forget this. I was preaching my heart out one Sunday, and, uh, and I began to talk about 
you know, to dying and things like that. And I said, what's going to happen? Somebody put a pistol in your head uh, and tell you not to call on Christ. She said, another. And she said, here's what she said. She said, I'd be in heaven before, he, before the sound ever went out. I've not seen her in a church that I know of in the last uh, 20 years. Amen. Not seen her in a church that I know of in the last 20 years. Boasting. Listen, it's a way to head toward backsliding in our life. We've got to be careful. And then we begin to be unwatchful in our life. Let me give you another one right here. Here's what happens when we get self-confidence. We begin to boast. We begin to get unwatchful in our life. Shame sits in. Shame sits in in our life. Look with me at verse number 54, if you would. Same chapter. The Bible says, and Peter followed him afar off. Can I say this? It was a time when Christ was now less popular with the crowd. When Christ was less popular with the crowd. See, it's easy to follow when Christ is popular with the crowd and we're following Christ. But when he gets less popular with the crowd, if we're not careful, we tend to follow him a little bit further away. Amen. We, we tend to be a little bit ashamed of who he is and what he's done in our life. And I'm not saying, listen to this, I'm not saying that Peter was not following Christ, but he was not following him close enough to be identified with him. There are those that are in a backslidden condition today, and they'll say, oh, I, well, I hadn't left Jesus, <laughs> I, I know, but... You're just not identified with him anymore. Your life is not identified with him anymore. Your home is not identified with him anymore. Matter of fact, there are pastors that are in pulpits all over America today that their lives are not identifying with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What they're saying and what they're preaching in our pulpits today, it does not identify with Jesus Christ. It identifies what the world wants to hear. They don't want to be challenged on their life. They don't want to think that they've uh, backslidden in life. We find here that that Peter followed him uh, uh, far off because he did not want to bear the reproach of Christ and who Christ was here in his life. So therefore, it was easier to follow him uh, far off. Let me just tell you what happens in this matter right here of shame. We begin to follow uh, Christ afar off. It's followed by neglect of prayer. And it's followed by neglect of Bible reading. And it's followed by neglect of, uh, of worship. And it's followed by neglect of fellowship with church people. It's followed by neglect of giving uh, to God in the things of our life. When we begin to follow Christ afar off, and listen, we say we're followers of Christ, but we don't want our life to identify with Him. All of these things fall into place in our life. And it's just a sure sign that it's a guide to backslide. It is a guide to backslide. I'm thankful that, listen, I am nobody, and I ain't trying to be boastful right here, but I'm thankful to know that if somebody were to ask today, that, man, listen, you you stand for Christ. I'm a born-again Christian. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I'm thankful for that. But what happens when the whole crowd turns the other way? What happens when the whole church turns the other way? I was asked, Recently, and I uh, hope I don't get myself in trouble here. Sometimes I do. Um, they, um, James, James is a great teacher. Would you all agree with that? And I believe, just about believe, she could preach the Word of God. Amen? Uh, but that's not what the Bible says. And somebody asked me recently, they said, what would you do? If your church said they wanted her to preach and not you. I said, well, we'd take a vote on it. If the church said that's what we want, we'd take a vote on it. That would be between her and the church. And what I'd do would be between me and God. Amen, and the church. Well, what would, he said, what would you do? I said, if they voted on it, I'd find me another church. He said, you would not go to church and listen to a wife preach. I said, no, I hear her seven days a week at home. If you think I'm going to go sit on a pew and get that kind of abuse for an hour and a half, that ain't going to happen. 
Miss Allison, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I did. I said, I'll find me another church. Amen. If it's something you don't believe in, listen, we, we just have to. He said, Preach, I'm talking about your whole church. And I said, Well, I, I, I would know all of them gone left by then. Amen. There's sometimes in our life we have to stand. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. Not that she can't teach and preach better than most preachers I know, including me. Matter of fact, she wrote a good sermon today. Y'all say amen. I don't ever tell her what I'm going to preach. Amen. Hardly ever. I've done it probably a couple of times since I've been pastoring. And she said, I can't believe you told me that. I said, I'm going to switch it by Sunday. Because I'm always afraid. So, you know, his, 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 because she's more um, concerned, I guess, and more has a, has a, a bigger heart than me. She's like, you think that's going to hurt somebody's feelings? I didn't ask God that. <laughs> God asked me to preach that part. I didn't ask God it's going to hurt anybody. That's up to God whether it hurt anybody's feelings or not. Well, I don't know if I'd say that if you ain't preaching today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but listen, shame will set in. Young people, look up here at me. Don't let shame sit in on your life of Christ. You don't have to stand up and be boastful and overconfident in it, but know who you are. Know that you love God. Don't be following Christ afar off. I know a lot of these kids sitting here going to college. You said the other that that college crowd, listen, they'll mess with your mind. Those teachers will mess with a mess with your mind. Listen, I, 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 I love that, that movie, He's Not Dead. I like the idea that one young boy sitting there and go, I can't sign that. I can't, I can't sign that paper saying he's dead. Boy, that, guy, that professor tried to uh, intimidate him. He said, I'm sorry, I can't say it. Amen. But listen, we, if we're not careful when the crowd get, listen to me, just when the crowd, listen, because it's easy to serve God in this crowd. Amen. But when you get out in that worldly crowd, and you say, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take part in that. Now, some of them get a little offended because here they are. Well, I guess you think you're goody two-shoes. No, I just think you're goody bad shoes. <laughs> Amen. I, say, I don't say that, but that's what I want to say sometimes. And no, I'm sorry, I can't stay here and I can't stay amongst this. I, listen, I, I'm, not your I'm not your judge, but that's just not who I am in that. Amen. But we find here self-confidence, step number one. Step number two, boasting. Step number three, unwatchfulness in our life. And I, listen, I cannot, I cannot, cannot, cannot say enough to you parents in your homes. I, I don't want to run your home, but you better be careful what you allow in your homes. You better be careful where you allow your kids to go. You better make sure you watch them uh, at all times. I'm going to tell you, it's dangerous out there in the world this day and time. Little things come in your home and get in your home. You try to get them out of ten times as, as bad. But then shame sits in, and we don't want to follow him. We don't want to uh, bear that reproach of Christ, and we neglect prayer, and we, de we neglect reading, and we neglect uh, worship, and we neglect giving. But, but we say, we say, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still following. I'm, I'm way over here, but I'm following him. I know, but you are completely not identifying with Christ at all. What has happened? He has surely backslidden from God. They've surely gotten away from God. Step number five, worldliness. Again, in verse number 54, the Bible says, And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Peter felt more comfortable, listen to this, with a worldly crowd than he did with Christ. Now, Christian, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I have a problem with this right here, and you ought to have a problem with it. There ought to be something that clicks in your mind when you're more comfortable with the worldly crowd than you are with Christ. There's something wrong with a Christian or, or the relationship with you and Christ when you are more comfortable in that crowd than you are God's crowd. Amen. I'm surely a more comfortable in God's crowd than I am in that crowd. Peter sat here uh, serving, uh, sitting with the servants and warmed himself uh, by the fire. He had fell out of step uh, with Christ. And listen, and now it becomes natural to warm at the fire with the world. It becomes a natural feeling. It becomes a natural occasion 
in our life. We don't have a problem sitting around no matter what's being being dumped in our ears. And I have to tell people from time to time, hey, 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 I can't let, I, I hear enough of it as it is. I can't let my ears be trashed again. We're around people all the time that do that. Amen. And we have to be so careful with it from time to time. And then we go and sit around. But we get comfortable sitting around. I, I've had to walk off sometimes. I had to leave places. Uh, sometimes I've had to change seats. Uh, sometimes without, you know, because this day and time, man, you can't say anything. If you say anything at all, listen, you are that goody two-shoes. And somebody's all upset because they're about half drunk and they want to fight, you know, because they haven't said all these ugly words. You just want to get away from them. And I'm like, no, nah, just talk to the hand. I'm gone. I, I'll see you. I'll see you later, amen. But listen, worldliness, we begin, listen, we begin to get comfortable with the worldly crowd. And here's the thing. We would be uncomfortable bringing them to church. We would be uncomfortable if God's crowd showed up, amen, at that time. Uh, And it would deter us from some things. And life, so worldliness becomes step number five. And listen, I'm just giving you the guy the backslide just in case you want to do it anymore. Just in case, you can go write all these down. Amen. That way, you'll know how. In case we anybody needs an improvement on it, write them all down. That way, you'll know how. Amen. I, I hope you know that's reverse psychology. Amen. Uh, I ain't gonna do. Okay, I'm, I'm just telling you. Step number six, here we go. Deny it. Deny it. Verse 70, and he denied him again. Well, how many times we would have to deny God before God says, okay, uh, listen, that, that, that was enough. Amen. Or how many times have we denied him in our life? Denial, listen, denial is a consequence of self-confidence. Denial is a consequence of boasting. Amen? Somebody called me the other day and asked me a question. They asked me a question about a pastor, um, and it was a basically a, a, a quote that his pastor made, a prophecy that he made. And uh, they said, what happens if this don't come true? It's real simple. He's a false prophet. Amen? Or God just didn't tell him that. Real, 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 real simple. But if you were to go to them, they would deny it in every way and say, well, you don't understand this. This is going to take place. That's going to take place. This is going to take place. And I'm like, yeah, right. Amen. And so if we're not careful in our life, we get in a order of denial in our life. And it's, and it's when we start to get as far as we can get away from Christ. We can still see Christ. We can still see the church. We can still see the work. But we've gotten over here so far that we begin to deny the work. We begin to deny who God is and the work of God. And listen, can I tell you, they are dropping out like flies uh, this day and time. I, I, I was watching a, a little video, a little clip the other day that somebody put out, and they were talking about the King James Bible. And this quote-unquote pastor, I use that term very loosely in that matter, was talking about the King James Bible. And, here's, and he was talking about how dangerous it is to read that to your kids. How dangerous it is to read that to your kids. And, uh, and he, listen, he was talking about it being a law against it. A law against reading that to your kids because it's so dangerous. Because it straight truth in it. I mean, they're in denial. They're in denial of who God is. They're in denial of the power of God by this time. Listen, they're, they're in denial of, about the, the, the Word of God at this time. Listen, we, be, we get in denial in our life. The further we get away from God, the further we start to deny the things of God and who God is and what God has done and what God can do in our life. Well, that, that, that didn't really happen. We began to deny it. But did the Word of God, did the Word of God say it happened? Then it happened. Amen. Did the Word of God say it's going to happen? Then it's going to happen. But if we listen, if we get back to it long enough, trust me, we will start to deny that to make ourselves feel good in life. 
and it becomes a natural consequence in our life. Uh, lethargy, we get very lethargic about it, unless we get in denial about it. We, the, the world is, we say, well, well I'm, I'm not living in the world. <laughs> well, you're not living in church. You're not living for God. I like these people saying, you know, well, you know, we don't, we don't need the church and we don't need, I'm like, you believe in tithing? Well, I said, where are you going to send your tithe to? Because God's word says it goes to the local church. Amen. They come up with every excuse and deny every way that they can. You'd be surprised at the number of people we deal, from, deal with from time to time. They get in complete denial in their life. And I'll tell you why. The world and the devil will put pressure on them and they'll be forced to either confess Christ and walk away or deny Christ and stay. They'll be forced to either confess Christ and stay or, or deny Christ and stay or confess Christ and have to walk away. Amen? Because, once, listen, once we start denying Christ, it's easy to send it to the crowd. And if you confess him, you're not going to feel comfortable. They're not going to feel comfortable in what they do. But denial is one of the greatest things. Listen, the, the, the devil works in a process here, amen? Uh, we, he gets us a little boastful. He gets a little, gets a little self-confidence like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the man. I got this, amen? Can't nobody tell me no different. I, I, listen, I, listen ain't, ain't nobody going to tell me that I'm going to deny Christ. Ain't nobody going to tell me that I'm going to walk away. I can tell you right now, I'm going to be here. We get unwashed. We get comfortable in our life. We begin to uh, not see things that are coming into our life that the devil's sliding in. From time to time, before you know it, we're in a little bit of shame. We're having to walk away. And before you know it, we don't mind sitting with the worldly crowd. Uh, in our life, becomes very natural to us. And then we begin to deny God and the things of God. I cannot tell you the number of people that have said in good Bible-believing church over the years, been preached to over the years, that will now completely deny the existence of God. I'm talking about people that said they were once born again. Uh, people that shouted the glory for God and said they were once born. They once belonged to God. I, I heard this come from a Muslim's mouth yesterday. A Muslim's mouth. I don't know, have y'all watched the uh, Trump uh, thing when he was, I'm trying to, was he in Michigan yesterday? Is that where it was? Uh, and the Muslims endorsed him, endorsed him yesterday. And the Muslim said, the Muslim raised his hand and said this, I believe that God spared him twice in them assassinations. He said, I believe that God is going to do this and God is, I'm talking about a Muslim. Amen? Stood on stage yesterday and said, I believe that God did this, and I believe that God uh, did that. Yet still, we've got pastors behind good pulpits that are denying the existence of God. There's people that said they were born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, have gotten away from God. They deny God in their life. He's one of the greatest and most dangerous steps that we take when we begin to deny God. We've gotten just about to the end. Now, here's the end of it. Here's that last step right here to backsliding is recklessness. Recklessness. Our life becomes a wreck. Verse 71. Here it is. But he began to curse. And to swear. Can you imagine this? Now, most of us are sitting here today going, uh-uh. That, that, I, I can tell you now, that won't ever happen to me. Woo. Be careful. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, I don't ever want to get to this position in life. Our life becomes reckless. We, listen, we ain't talking about him cursing in the world. We're talking about him cursing Christ and denying the name of Christ and swearing by the name of Christ. His life had gotten so reckless at this time that he did not mind even cursing the name of of Jesus Christ himself. Time and time again, I've dealt with people in 
men out in the world that used to be saved. And, of course, they got out in the world. They Listen, they followed every one of these steps right here. And I've listened to those same men use God's name in vain. Curse God. Curse the church. Swear by the name of Christ. Tell you how sorry and uh, the, how sorry the church is and everything about that. Listen, I'm talking about these same people that once walked with God. Peter wrote the guys to backslide. And, friend, if we're not careful, we start to follow these steps. Listen, and most of them we don't even realize because the devil is very subtle and very subtle in what he does. He, you become unwatchful. You become a little, a little lazy, and he will slide right. As I said to the, to the married class this morning, he will slide right in your marriage. He'll slide right in the life of your kids just so easy. He'll slide in through forms that you never thought of. In life, when our kids were growing up, and we tell them, "No, you can't do this." No, they they could not, they could not understand. But I could see the devil and the world written all over it. Uh, I could see tragedy coming in their life, and I said, "No, you can't go here. No, you can't go there. No, you can't spend the night over there. No, you can't uh, happen here." Listen, we we have to be so careful and watch. Why? Because I have watched lives become completely reckless because of it. Marriages destroyed, homes destroyed, children destroyed, churches destroyed, ministries destroyed. You want to know why? They followed this guy. It didn't just start up. They, they, they didn't just all of a sudden, they're Christian one day and curse God the next. It was a process in their life. It was a process in their life. And friend, if we're not careful, every little thing we do, we have to be watchful because it becomes a process in our life. I know people look at us, and especially Jane and I sometimes, they say, I don't, I don't understand why y'all wouldn't do that. Listen, I, I, have, to, I have to stay clear of that. Amen, because I know who I am. I'm sorry than dirt. I was sorry than dirt before I got saved. Now I'm just a sorry, sorry than dirt saved sinner. Amen. I know what the flesh is. I know the flesh is my enemy. I know how the flesh will take over. I know what the flesh flesh desires. Listen, I know how it will. As I said Wednesday night, that, that, listen, that old man inside of you didn't get reformed. And it didn't get removed. It's still there. That's why there's a war in your flesh all the time. That's why there's a, a lust in our flesh all the time for the things of the world. And listen, if we follow this God, our lives will become very reckless. In our lives. Young people, I pray you would hear me today in this. What is the cure for backsliding? I can tell you this in verse 72, the end of the story. And I pray you go back and read this story. And the second time the cock crew and Peter called to mind the words Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. He said, Peter, you need to be careful. I understand all your boasting. I understand you say you love me. But before that cock crows twice, before that rooster crows twice, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, no, I, Lord, I, not, not me. Here's the answer to it. And when he thought thereon, he wept. He wept. What is the remedy to not following this guy? Blake, come get on the piano for me, bud. What is the remedy to not following this guy? Tell you something, friend, we need to be around an old-fashioned altar. We need to be weeping over our family. We need to be weeping over our church. We need to be weeping over our decisions. We need to be weeping over our children in our life. We need to, we need to be weeping and begging God to help us to be more watchful in our life. We need to say, God, help us not to be so overconfident, God, that we miss the mark. God, we want to be confident in who you are in us. But, God, don't let it be about me. And, God, don't let me boast anything of me. God, let me boast everything of you in my life. Let me put you on the pedestal. Let me magnify you. Let me worship you. And, listen, in order for you to worship God, you must humble yourself 
You must get on your knees. Listen, the very word, if you look up the definition of worship, it means to get on our knees and lick our master's hand as a dog would lick his master's hand. Well, I worship God today, not unless you've been on your knees. Listen, not unless you've not unless you've been as sorry as that old dog and you've been on your knees and you've looked up and you've licked on the master's hand today and you've loved on the master today and you've looked at the master and said, God, you're everything and I'm nothing. He must increase and we must decrease. God, I'm a failure. God, I am no good. I'm trying to everything I can, but God, I love you. Listen, we didn't worship God because we were standing around raising our hand uh, in the air. We didn't worship God because the band was good. We didn't worship God because the choir was good. We didn't worship God because the, uh, the preacher was good today. Listen, worship is when we fall down on our knees before a holy God and say, God, I am sorry. God, I need help. I need to know how to raise my family. God, I need to be more watchful. I, I don't want to be self-confident in me. I, I don't want to be boastful in me, God. I don't ever want to be ashamed of you. Uh, with the word of God, Father, I, I don't want to fall into a, a world and it's out of the world. I don't want to have to be the one that uh, denies you, God. I don't want to be the one that becomes reckless in my life. I don't want to follow the God to backslide. God, if you would, let me get on my knees and worship you today. And then and only then will we be trying our best to keep from getting started on this guy. Some of you have already sit here this morning. Clayton, you start playing a little bit, buddy. Some of you have already sit here this morning. Here's what you've already said. Look, at, look up here at me. Young people, you too. Here's what you've already said. I'm already at step number two. Some may have said, uh, I'm already at step number four. I've already been a little too self-confident. I thought I could handle it and I boasted in that, and and I hadn't been as watchful as I ought to be in my life. And now there's a little shame in me to have to proclaim the name of Christ out in the world and around my friends, or at my school, or at my work. There's that I can't, I can't quite get get it out there. I, I'm, I'm preaching. I'm already step number four. What I do, turn around, man. You get to step number five. Turn around before you get to step number six. Turn around before you get to step number seven. And look up here. And wreck your life. And carry the sin scars for the rest of your life. Does not mean that God can't use you again. I want you to understand if you're already at step number seven today. God will still wash you as white as snow. He will still forgive those. Listen, he, he'll still use you just like he used Peter. But you cannot be used until we humble ourselves before a holy God and confess to God where we're at. Lord, I'm step number one. Lord, I didn't realize I was so self-confident. Lord, I, I'm at step number five. I, I, God, I didn't realize I'd gotten so worldly. God, I didn't even realize I was denying you around my co-workers and, and, and I, I didn't I, I didn't want to I didn't want to bow my head and pray because all of them were at the table. Been saying a blessing over your meal all these years. But now that the table is crowded, you go. Uh. Lord, I didn't know I'd gotten that shameful. See, there's a guy that backslides. And if we're not careful, friend, every I'm saying every one of us, every one of us will fall into that category somewhere. I don't know where you are. I can tell you this. God showed me this week where I was. Preach, I want to know that ain't none of your business. You need to know where you are. Only God needs to know where I'm at. Amen. So I beg you today as we stand, there's a God up in heaven that loves you just like He loved Peter. He'll forgive you today. He'll change your direction. You'll be able to go backward on those steps instead of going forward on them. There's a guy in the backslide. How about you today? Where are you at with Christ? Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a few minutes. Would you